Dr. Maman, are we set? We are ready to go, sir. Yeah, so are you letting in people anytime now or? Are we live? Okay, sir. I'll just I'll just tell mom and sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Good evening, sir. Yes. Doctor Maman. Sir, we are live, sir. Doctor Maman, I heard nobody is able to enter. Tachandi, sir, just called me. Nobody is able to enter. It seems. There are people coming in, sir. Only one person has come now, right? People are. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, Maman. Uh, where are the people? I do not know why. why, why. Good evening, sir. Uh, Maman, is, is everything right? Can we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this international webinar at Believers Church Medical College and Hospital. Today's title is Frailty and Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment. And to talk to us about this very interesting topic is consultant geriatrician from the UK, Dr. Maya Mukundan. She completed her MBBS from PSG IMS and R, a very vibrant student she was, and went on to do her MPH, epidemiology, from the University of Alabama and Birmingham School of Public Health, USA, and then went on to do her MRCP in London before training in geriatrics. She currently works as a specialty registrar in geriatrics at Broomfield Hospital, Clemsford, UK. Welcome, Dr. Maya. Thank you very much for the introduction. And to moderate the session, we have none other than the professor and head of geriatrics of Christian Medical College, CMC Bellor, and also the medical superintendent of Christian Medical College, Dr. Prasad Matthews, sir. He's also the president of the Indian Academy of Geriatrics with 
more than 30 publications and his areas of interest include dementia among other topics and he, is, he has been thesis guide for postgraduate students, postdoctoral fellowship students, external internal examiner for postgraduate students, and he has written training modules for NPHC Ministry of Health. He's registered with the Royal Australian College of Physicians and also a member of the Indian Academy of Geriatrics. It's a great honor to have you with us, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, and over to Dr. Prashad Matthew, sir, uh, for the moderation and to hand over to Dr. Maya. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, so Dr. Maya will be talking out to us about uh, frailty and uh, comprehensive geriatric assessment. Now, when we look at a, uh, an elderly patient, even a layman can often say that this patient looks frail. So what is frailty all about? It's about uh, defining it exactly, quantifying it, uh, measuring it, uh, seeing how you can prevent these patients from coming to harm and seeing whether it can be reversed. And comprehensive ge geriatric assessment is an important uh, cornerstone of uh, geriatrics where you identify all the problems of a patient, whether it's medical, social, uh, financial, psychological, functional, etc., etc. Anyway, I, I won't uh, go on. Um, I invite, uh, I think this is a, a very le relevant topic for Kerala, which is like probably the uh, state in India with the highest number of geriatric, uh, percentage of geriatric population. So I request Dr. Maya to go ahead with the talk. And we'll Thank take you. questions at the end. If you have questions, you can just Type them in the chat window and we'll address them at the end. Dr. Maya. I am trying to share my screen. Um, Just click on share screen and then uh, identify the, your presentation from your computer. First open your presentation on the computer. Idea why it's not letting me. Uh, Maya, just just minimize Zoom and open the presentation first. Yeah. Then go it's back to. Open. Then go back to Zoom and click on share screen. I did that, but. Um... Now what problem are you facing, man? Click on share screen and then uh, identify the PowerPoint in your computer. Sorry about that. Okay, just uh, start from the beginning. Just uh... Maya, can you please uh, t tell us what the issue is? Uh, Dr. Marman, yeah. who is our tech specialist, he can help you. What exactly is your problem? Okay, I'm trying to actually, uh, you know, you know, I'm going to call my husband, <laughs> huh. call your friend. Uh, Just minimize the, your Zoom screen first and uh, open the PowerPoint. Leave it open on the computer. Yeah, it is open. Hi, Raj. Yeah. Can you come yeah. down for a minute? I'm not able to share my screen. Can you just help me? Thanks, bye. I am sorry. Um, I've just changed my computer, so I don't know. Just stop screen sharing and try again. Try to start again. Stop screen sharing. Yeah. Then start again. Oh, lovely. Share. Click on screen square. Yeah, oh, yeah you got, got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, now you got it. Um, Go ahead. 
Raj, I've managed to do it. You don't have to. You can go back. Thanks. I've managed to do it. So, um, play slide. Okay. Put it on full screen and go ahead. Yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks, Jacob, for the opportunity um, to let me present. Um, uh, it, it was definitely a good thing because you learn with every every time you teach. That's when you learn. And I, if there's one thing that COVID nineteen pandemic has, uh, if there's one good it's done, it's definitely better utilization of the digi digital media. Um, so here we go, frailty and um, comprehensive geriatric assessment. Why doesn't it go to the next one? Okay, so no relevant financial or uh, disclosures of conflict of interest. Um, so frailty, what is it? It's often an aging related syndrome of physiological decline, a state of increased vulnerability to resolution of homeostasis after a stressor event. As you can see in the picture, um, someone in, uh, who is um, less dependent and frail, less frail as, as um, uh, depicted as in the green line could have a minor stressor event like a UTI. And um, there might be a, a small decline in the functional abilities, but they get back to their baseline quickly and uh, that, that's it. But however, someone who's more uh, dependent and frail has a similar stressor um, uh, as depicted in the red line, has a much bigger dip in their uh, functional abilities and it takes much longer for them um, to get back and they would probably not go back to their original baseline functional status. Um, so this is because of the, uh, the uh, dip in their physiological reserves so they're not able to get back to the baseline. Characterized by weakness and fatigue, medical complexity and reduced tolerance to medical and surgical interventions. It may result in increased risk of falls, delirium, disability, hospitalization, institutionalization and death. Um, it's important to know that it's a dynamic state, both modifiable and reversible. Although not completely reversible, um, uh, to a great extent you can, especially in mild and moderate frail status. Um, the prevalence uh, increases with age, as you can see, 60 to 69 years, the prevalence is 6.5%, while those more than 90, it's 65%, and this is in the UK. Um, it's more in females than males. Um, talking about the domains of frailty, uh, this picture shows um, very well the complex interplay of um, uh, the different uh, aspects of frailty and the dynamic nature as well. So if you see, if some, when someone comes to the hospital, uh, it might be an acute stressor, any, any of the frailty syndromes like a fall or infection, um, uh, anything and but you have to also look at the multimorbidity or long-term conditions which include maybe vision hearing impairment their dentition uh, continence mobility and so on or and, and other chronic conditions like maybe COPD or heart failure whatever it is uh, you might need to address that as well but also look into their psychological status which it not only includes the recognized psychological conditions like depression, anxiety, or uh, psychosis, but also um, gender uh, feelings of uh, confidence and um, motivation, emotional and spiritual well being. And we also look into the social aspects. Which, which includes their family, friends, community, anyone who's important to them, the next of kin and so on. And then the physical aspect, which starts right from outside their body, including the clothing and the shoes, the house they live in and the uh, transport facilities available, et cetera. And the systems of care, which includes integration of health and social care, sharing information between the different systems and the amount of ex carer and patient support provided, including benefits and um, um, respite, et cetera. As you know, as 
as you age or, um, or the frailty progresses, it's harder to balance these domains. But if one is challenged, quality of life can still be improved by promoting resilience in the other domains. It's important to support individual decisions and choices of patients and support self-care of patients because that helps in building confidence. This is uh, a slide pretty much showing um, the uh, different activities of daily living in order of increasing complexity, which is um, uh, measured in the Barthel index. It's scored out of 20. Uh, the lower your score, the more dependent and frail you are. So these activities of daily living would include your bowel, bladder, grooming, toilet use, feeding, and um, transfers. As in like bowel and bladder, we're talking about continence. And um, the toilet use is whether you're uh, able to use your toilet alone or you need some help. Um, and of course, feeding and transfer, whether you need help and mobility in terms of using aids, dressing, um, use of stairs and bathing. So as you see, bathing and stairs are all quite complicated things. Like you have to get into the shower, undress and take a shower. It, it is more of a complicated ADL. Um, now coming to frailty models, there are two main models. One's the Fried's phenotypic model, which was derived from the cardiovascular health study. This um, mainly looks into uh, the physical aspects of frailty. You've got five aspects uh, or domains, which are uh, physical inactivity, which is low energy expenditure. And then you've got low muscle strength, which can be measured using grip strength, uh, you know, using a dynamometer and slow gait speed of less than 0.8 meter per second with or without a walking aid. And all of these are adjusted to the ethnicity and uh, um, uh, gender. And um, exhaustion uh, and fatigue, which is self-reported and weight loss of 10 pounds or more, or, or more in a year or a BMI of less than 18.5. And you, can, uh, give, uh, you score zero or one for each category and a score of zero is not frail, one to two is pre-frail and three or more is mild, moderate or severe frail as uh, three, four, five respectively. Um, although this is quite incomplete and looks only into the physical aspect, all of these are quite easily measurable and therefore more useful for the physiotherapists. And the next um, other important model is the Rockwood's uh, clinical frailty model, which was derived from the Canadian study of health and aging. It's validated in adults over 65 and it's more holistic. It includes the cognitive, psychological and social factors as well. Um, one of the derivatives of this is the electronic frailty index, index, which initially included about 92 deficits or impairments, which included signs um, uh, and symptoms like uh, shortness of breath, diseased state of the patient, could be anything from Parkinson's or a stroke, disability, uh, like you know, needing help to use the toilet or mo uh, using mobility aids and so on. And then it was finally reduced to 36. So how do you calculate it? It's the number of impairments uh, that the patient has divided by the total number of parameters, which is 36. And um, the closer to one it is, the more frail the patient is. And um, this uh, category also fits very well into the Rockwood's clinical frailty uh, scale, um, which has nine categories. And then you have the Edmonton frailty scale, which is used. Uh, so the electronic frailty index is used here in the UK in uh, GP surgeries, uh, which is basically uh, your uh, general physicians. And Edmonton Frailty Scale is used in elective surgery. It has nine domains. It's more detailed and it's used um, and hence uh, only in pre-op settings of healthy patients. Um, this Rockford Frailty Scale is the one we use in hospitals. Um, it's um, uh, very uh, descriptive in terms of you've got a picture and then you've got the uh, explanation. So once you get go through this, you, it's easy to then uh, identify the frailty scale with just the picture. Um, so you start from very fit and they're robust, energetic, and then they're well, just about managing well when they've got medical problems. And when you're vulnerable, you're, uh, you do have limitations of activity and you're slowed, but you're um, not 
still dependent on others. And when you're mildly frail, you're dependent on higher order activities of daily living, like finances, transport, and heavy housework, and so on. When you're moderately frail, um, you need help with um, things like shower um, and uh, keeping your house and so on. And severely frail, even more dependent and uh, very severely frail, uh, completely dependent and so on. And terminally ill, you, uh, you have a life expectancy of less than six months. Um, so those were the different frailty scales um, used. Uh, Fit for Frailty is uh, developed by the British Geriatric Society to manage, recognize and manage frailty uh, in the outpatient settings when they come to our clinics. They're usually given this PRISMA 7 questionnaire. You're expected to answer the seven questions. Are you more than 85 male? Any health problems that limit your activities? And um, you need someone to help on a regular basis and your health problems that require you to stay at home. Or can you count on someone when you're in need? And uh, do you regularly use a stick to walk? A stick or any walking aid. So if you score three or more and a gait test where you walk for four meters more than five seconds, uh, if you take more than five seconds for four meters or a timed up and go test where you get up uh, without using your arms, um, with your arms folded across and, uh, and uh, walk for about three meters if you take more than three seconds, uh, 10 seconds. These are all indicative of uh, frailty. And then you follow up. And these are also used for monitoring in future, um, as in like uh, the progression of frailty during future appointments. And you follow this with comprehensive geriatric assessment. Why identify frailty? As um, uh, uh, explained by uh, Dr. Prasad Matthews, um, it, it has been known to improve outcomes um, and uh, you wanna avoid harm to these patients because as you grow older, you're less, um, um, uh, you're less able to tolerate any invasive treatments and surgeries and so on. So um, you need to make the right decisions for these patients, prepare them for minor stresses and manage demands, uh, patient demands, comorbidities, and initiate discussion around the prognosis and life expectancy and so on. And it's also Im important to communicate this to your to the GPs and also for your own self, when, you, when the patient comes back, you know, uh, uh, for follow-up, you know, if the patient's actually deteriorated. Sarcopenia. Uh, this is an important aspect of uh, the pathogenesis of frailty. Um, low, it, it is skeletal myopathy, basically. Low muscle strength from loss of mass and quality of physical performance. The greatest loss is um, in the postural and weight-bearing muscles of the lower back and the upper legs and so on. 10 days in hospital can lead to 10 years worth of muscle loss in those more than 85, which is quite significant, which is why we want patients to stay for lesser duration in hospital and try to get them up and going and get them out of the hospital as soon as possible. Um, it is affected by age, because uh, there is decreasing testosterone levels. Uh, physical activity, and that's a vicious circle because you're less physically active, makes you more frail, and uh, because of uh, uh, disuse atrophy, and then you uh, even become even more physically active, and so on. Malnutrition, which includes under and overnutrition. So undernutrition, um, I mean, first of all, there's uh, the cachexia of frailty, where there's increased um, demand, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, where there's like a reduced appetite, and there is greater demand when there is a stressor, but also um, increased insulin resistance in overweight, but also generally in the elderly uh, can lead to um, uh, reduced uh, insulin-like growth factors that contributes and also other conditions like inflammatory and uh, neurological conditions. Um, it is associated with cardiac and respiratory conditions and dementia. It can increase your risk of falls impaired activities of daily living, institutionalization, and early death. It's measured using grip strength. Uh, you can use a, a, a dynamometer, and the muscle mass can be measured using a DEXA scan, and physical performance using gait speed and timed up and go test. There have been only a few uh, randomized clinical trials done, 
um, but they have found that resistance training benefits most uh, in these patients with sarcopenia. Protein supplements do help, but only in conjunction with exercise and not when given alone. Often what we do in wards is that we see patients are not uh, really uh, taking much uh, intake and then we just blindly prescribe the protein supplements, with, but this really doesn't help unless you uh, pair it up with appropriate physical activity and exercises. The protein requirement is about 50 gram a day, uh, which uh, was 0.8 gram per kilogram per day, and you can increase up to 1.2. Um, and also there has been some indication that essential amino acids, especially leucine, has been uh, found to be associated with improvement in sarcopenia when supplemented. Exercise. Uh, coming to exercise, so a combination, although we say that the resistance exercise has been found to have most evidence, we do provide a combination of exercises, including resistance, aerobic, balance, uh, flexibility exercises, and high intensity interval, tra interval training. Uh, the intervention has been found to, to provide maximum benefit for moderately frail patients all, as compared to the mild and severely frail ones. And now coming to comprehensive geriatric assessment. So uh, we've just finished uh, the frailty bit. Any questions? Okay, let's go to comprehensive uh, geriatric assessment. What is it? It's a multidimensional, holistic, interdisciplinary diagnostic process focused on determining a frail older patient's medical, psychological, functional capability in order to develop a coordinated and integrated plan for treatment and long-term follow-up. So when you talk about psychological, you're also looking at cognit cognitive and affective aspects. And functional will include your social environment, financial and quality of living, activities of daily living, and so on. So you're basically assessing the patient holistically and trying to support them in every aspect. So they, uh, in order to improve their reserves as much and prevent readmissions and decrease length of stay and so on. So why do you do this? Because it's been found to reduce mortality and morbidity and it costs less than medical care. Um, according to a meta-analysis, um, the number needed to treat to prevent one long-term care admission or institutionalization is 20 using a CGA as compared to aspirin to prevent stroke, which requires a number of 120. And how do you do this? Uh, you bring about a patient-centered care plan rather than a fragmented disease-specific care plan. So, and you involve the family. So as you know, um, when patients have multiple health conditions, for example, COPD and maybe heart failure or ischemic heart disease, they tend to go to different specialists for, different, for each of them. But once they get old and frail, um, it is important to do the holistic assessment uh, for them and try and reduce specialist referrals because uh, there are you need to look at patient as a, as a whole. There are multiple um, uh, issues here. For example, a patient with different conditions would have would be on so many medications, and they you know you need to look at their interactions, which we will be looking in soon. And also, uh, certain medications and treatments are not as effective in the elderly. Like those more than ninety years, there is no evidence of use of bisphosphonates for bone protection, or any secondary preventive measures like using aspirin or clopidogrel. Uh, the risk is more than the benefit. And um, surgical interventions may not be as appropriate in the elderly and so on. So it's all uh, be, uh, tailored to the patient's needs. So when the patient comes, you first address their modifiable precipitating causes. They might have come in with an acute condition like a heart, fa uh, heart failure or infection. 
And then you look at their polypharmacy, uh, address that, and also other ma major comorbidities. Uh, and uh, constipation is one of the common acute presenting symptom uh, condi uh, conditions. And then you try to improve other core manifestations of frailty, like their mobility, um, instability, inanition or poor nutrition, intellectual impairment, which is cognitive decline, and so on, uh, isolation, incontinence. And then you come up with a personalized care plan, which is to minimize the consequences of vulnerability. Um, so you assess the patient's uh, current uh, physical status and uh, uh, look into uh, th uh, things like advanced care planning, which is what we have here is the proactive elderly advanced care plan, wherein you uh, see if this patient is extremely frail, are they suitable for future admissions? When would you admit this patient? Uh, uh, and also ask patient for their uh, wishes, expressed wishes on where would they like to spend their last days or would they keep? Uh, would they want to keep coming to the hospital? Um, uh, what would they want to do with their dog? And all, all, all little details can be addressed, you know. And uh, definitely look into DNA CPR during admission, uh, because many of these patients would not be a suitable candidate for CPR. And uh, obviously, social support. Uh, if they need access to any rapid access clinics or uh, hearing or visual assessment uh, clinics uh, and uh, package of care can be addressed uh, if they need one and alcohol liaison and so on. Occupational therapy teams can look into the environmental risk factors like stairs, if they need downstairs living, if the heating is sorted, any special equipments are needed and you try to promote independence in the patient. Uh, because that improves confidence and improves um, uh, the quality of life for patients. So address anything that may hinder their independence, like chronic, chronic pain, visual or hearing impairment, uh, any isolation you can give them. Uh, uh, for example, here we've got the Age UK, which would send companion, which would, uh, send companion visits for patients when they're feeling lonely and volunteers uh, with, who help with other things like peer groups and day centers and so on. Um, so what, what I've done, if you notice, is mentioned um, a lot of conditions in I. These, these is, this is an acronym for the frailty syndromes or, um, so you've got the infection, iatrogenesis, impaction, immobility, instability, inanition, intellectual impairment, isolation, incontinence, impecunity, and impairment. So that's a good um, uh, acronym for you to know. So essentially what you're doing is following the principles of medical ethics, isn't it? You're just doing, uh, focusing on beneficence that is doing good to patient, but more importantly also, uh, or as importantly, non-maleficence, trying not to do harm in terms of look into your medications or avoid your treatments that satisfy you or the family rather than act or, or that rather than actually benefiting the patient. We don't want a situation where the operation is successful but the patient is dead, isn't it? So that's one thing. And autonomy, so respect patient wishes and justice as in fair in the societal perspective. So that was general picture of what you do in comprehensive geriatric assessment. And now we're going into frailty syndromes. I'm gonna address a few of them, not in excessive detail, but uh, just uh, brush through a few of them. Um, why we call these syndromes is because uh, rather than a uh, disease condition is because it's not just one etiology causing a specific pathogenesis, but but all of these are multifactorial, and that's very important to remember. And there is a complex interplay of all these factors. And so when you address them, you address the patient as a whole. Um, so in, in terms of intellectual impairment, what we're thinking is dementia, which is progressive decline of cognition, but also delirium, which is the acute confusional state. And these two can also be um, a, a, 
uh, depression can also mimic these two. So I've literally just um, uh, written down the different tests to assess each of them that we use. It's very important to know that delirium is more common in patients with dementia as well. So when the patient comes in, you do an abbreviated, what, what we do in the UK is we do an abbreviated mental uh, test, which is scored out of 10, which is an initial screening test. And a score of eight or, um, is indicative and uh, less than six is definite, uh, definitive indication of cognitive impairment. And this could be delirium or dementia, or, but uh, sometimes uh, issues uh, which can uh, interfere with this is patient could simply have very poor hearing and not wear a hearing aid. You might really think that the patient's not answering, but it's um, on, only because you've not addressed those issues. So it's very important to look into that or patients with a very low uh, education who might not know, know to answer questions like who's the prime minister because they just don't care. And um, um, yeah, uh, those things are need to be addressed or someone with aphasia, you need to look into how they can express the answers by writing down. And then once you do that, and for uh, dementia, there are certain tests like the, the next level of screening would be MMSE or mini mental state examination and MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Both scored out of 30 and a score of uh, um, 24 in MMSE or uh, less than 26 in MOCA is suggestive. Um, we don't uh, use MMSE as much because it's copyrighted and you need to adjust for the level of education because it's heavy on language and it does not, uh, it is quite uh, less sensitive for mild cognitive impairment. Montreal cognitive assessment has been used more because it, you, it is more sensitive for milder cognitive impairment and is valid, has been validated in multiple languages and um, also addresses the executive function. But again, this is soon becoming copyrighted. So we are moving to Adam Brooks cognitive examination, um, um, the mini one, but um, the, uh, the detailed one is scored out of 100, a score of 68 and some say less than 78 is more suggestive of cognitive decline. This is very detailed and you can um, uh, in fact differentiate the different types of dementia like Alzheimer's, front temporal, Parkinson's dementia, um, you know, progressive supranuclear palsy and Lewy body dementia and so on. So that's about assessment of dementia. And then we've got uh, uh, delirium, isn't it? So delirium is tested using, uh, there are two different methods. We can use either the CAM or confusion assessment method and 480s. Um, the CAM is uh, uh, less, uh, Sen uh, sensitive because, you know, uh, uh, an experienced geriatrician would be able to do it very easily, but uh, 480 is more validated and uh, uh, easier to do for a, even a physiotherapist. So it's preferred to, um, and we, we can see in detail in a minute. And of course, we've got this confounder, the depression. So if you think there are uh, signs of depression, you can uh, use a geriatric depression scale and a score of five or more out of 15 is more suggestive. It's a screening tool though. Um, and the good thing is it excludes physical symptoms because elderly patients already have other physical symptoms that can confound. And this is the 4AT that we use. So we look into alertness, uh, uh, and uh, then your AMT4, uh, which is basically age, date of birth, uh, the current year and the place. And then you uh, look for attention, which is uh, counting um, the seven months, uh, naming the seven months of the year, uh, naming the months of the year backwards, you have to get at least seven correct, or you could do uh, subtract, subtracting seven, serial sevens from hundred, about seven times at least, and so on. Um, and then of course, acute change or fluctuating course of um, the cognitive state. So a score of four or more is considered significant. And so, you know, either one of one or four could itself give you a suggestion of delirium. And the other important thing about patients with dementia is that it's very important to support them as much as you can whilst in hospital and therefore 
try to get to know them better. They often come with this document when diagnosed, which gives details about how their name, how they like to be addressed, and their family, their background, other medical conditions, what they like, and what, uh, what would worry or upset them, and how to co uh, comfort them if uh, they are anxious or upset. And these are very important to know because the risk of delirium is very high in these patients. So, you know, um, that, that makes it very important. And also, any patients with any patient with cognitive impairment, it's very important um, to get uh, collateral information. Um, uh, collateral information can be obtained from the family or the care home and um, worse comes towards the GP. Um, so you want to know more about their functional status, mobility, their memory, nutritional status, and so on. So um, that would, uh, if they're not able to, especially if they're not able to provide appropriate history, because that helps a lot with uh, treating them. So that was about um, cognition, cognitive impairment. And so the next um, important um, frailty syndrome is incontinence. Um, so there are three types of incontinence, the stress, urge, and overflow. And we're gonna talk about their cause, clinical feature, and treatment. It's important to know that stress and urge are more commonly, uh, you, we come across that more commonly. And um, the cause of stress is loss of uh, uh, structural uh, support to the bladder and urethra, as in multiple vaginal births, old age and menopause because of loss of, um, you know, uh, estrogen support to the pelvic tissues, obesity. And urge incontinence is from detrusor overactivity, as in bladder irritation, like cystitis, stones, and cancer, or loss of bladder inhibition, like stroke, Parkinson's disease, and spinal cord injury. Overflow incontinence is because of overdistension of bladder, and it could be due to impaired detrusor activity like diabetic neuropathy or multiple sclerosis and so on, or bladder outlet obstruction like a, a BPH or uh, maybe an ovarian tumor, etc. So uh, clinical feature, so people with stress incontinence obviously will tell you that they're coming, um, they, they leak during coughing, walking and sneezing, anything which increases the intra-abdominal pressure. But um, this usually never happens at night. That's very important to note. And um, identified using cough stress test or a Q-tip test. And um, uh, uh, urgent incontinence is usually due to involuntary detrusor contraction. So they would say that they always ha have the sense of urgency, even though their bladder is not full. And um, these patients do have nocturia. And overflow incontinence, also there is nocturia. And this frequent leakage of uh, large quantities of urine with a high residual volume as well. Um, although they have no urgency. So the treatment, is different for each of them. Therefore, it's important to identify the cause. Um, Maya, you have uh, unmuted yourself. Please unmute yourself, Maya. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. yes. So where did you actually stop hearing? Just a few seconds ago. You can keep going. Okay, lovely. Um, so the treatment for a stress incontinence, as I said, is because of pelvic floor weakness. So you do pelvic floor exercises and um, uh, refer to the physiotherapists and um, Atrophic vaginitis due to lack of estrogen. So you can give uh, estrogen pessaries and um, rarely you do the surgery um, um, to, uh, for strengthening the pelvic floor. And for urge incontinence, it's uh, what you give is anticholinergics uh, to reduce bladder irritation and overactivity of the bladder. You've got the non-selective ones, oxybutynin, tolterid, and trospium. These produce more side effects 
because they act everywhere, isn't it? And then you've got the more selective M2, M3 uh, uh, selective ones, which are solifenesin and beta-3 agonist uh, mirror background. Overflow incontinence, um, you would try to treat the cause. Again, it could be just fecal impaction. So you disimpact or uh, you know, BP, uh, surgery for TERP for BPH or, and so on. Uh, Maya, we are not able to hear you. Maya, we are not able to hear you. Unmute. What have I done? Hello. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you. Uh, we we heard up to Mira background. Oops, I'm sorry. I don't. I really don't know why this is happening, but yeah. So you get uh, and um, for overflow incontinence. Uh, here we go. I'm just gonna keep it this way, so I'm able to unmute myself whenever needed quicker. Um, so you treat. Um, you, the, uh, for overflow, you treat the co the cause, and if uh, if not, um, they uh, if it's uh, untreatable, like a neuropathy, you do intermittent catheterization. But you could disimpact the patient if there's impaction, or if there's BPH, you can do TERP and so on. Okay, and so that was about incontinence. So now coming to um, falls and instability. This is one of the most common presentations in elderly. Um, so we look, you look into the cause of the falls. There can be mental causes like dementia, psychosis, or delirium, weakness and frailty due to sarcopenia. Visual defects uh, are very important. Musculoskeletal defects uh, like joint and muscle deconditioning and arthritis, so on. Neurological conditions like epilepsy, stroke, Parkinson's. And these could be multifactorial, like loss of position, vibration sensation, loss of balance, increased reaction time. And even the medications for these conditions like Parkinson's can increase your risk of falls. Um, cardiovascular conditions like arrhythmia, orthostatic hypotension, and of course, medications for these conditions as well could increase the risk. And um, environment is very important to look into, including your footwear. I mean, that could be the simplest cause of the fall that you're not wearing appropriate footwear. So e easy, to th easy thing to address, but it's important to look into. And lighting and stair in your house, the rugs, how's the floor and so on. Um, the consequence of fall, you can see that there's uh, bruising uh, from a simple bruise to a major fracture like a hip fracture um, and increased inter uh, risk of intracranial bleed uh, from a head injury. Uh, long life can result in lab rhabdomyolysis, dehydration, pneumonia, and death. Immobility uh, as a result of fall um, for a prolonged period of time can lead to sarcopenia, stiffer joints, and deconditioning. And mental effects of fall, obviously, you've got a restricted lifestyle um, and you, uh, it, you lose your confidence and you develop a fear of falling, falling and therefore you start walking less and um, it can even cause depression. Uh, it can lead to social isolation from inability to leave home. Um, if sometimes it's just your, uh, the imagination uh, of the patient that they might not be able to leave, you know, when they can actually, and just the fear of it and uh, unable to pursue their hobbies. So what happens when a, when a patient comes with fall? The most important thing is to take appropriate history because that gives a lot of clue into the reason for the fall. Uh, you can identify the cause if it's if they're presenting with dizziness, it could be vestibular problem or orthostatic hypotension. If they're presenting with palpitations and uh, um, uh, so on, it's more arrhythmia and cardiovascular related. And you can, you know, that that's a complete topic in itself. But of course, yeah, if they've given history of um, um, uh, seizure or just say that they're uh, they never have good um, balance on their legs because they're Parkinson and so on. So that's quite important to get the history 
And then when you assess the patient, it's very important to get the ECG and the basic blood test, but also consider uh, scanning the head if they've had a significant head injury and they're on blood thinners and so on. And um, so that helps you identify the cause. And uh, it's very important to do lying and standing blood pressures for most of the elderly patient because a lot of the medications usually increase the risk of orthostatic hypotension, which you might have to address. So that was false. And also hip fracture is one of the major complications with associated with increased mobility and mortality in false patients. And these patients are commonly found to be uh, sarcopenic and vitamin D deficient. So um, you look into the osteoporotic risk fractures. Some of them are modifiable and some non-modifiable. So obviously age and gender, your race is all non-modifiable. So white, Asian are higher risk, females greater risk, family history of osteoporosis, previous fracture, um, and uh, BMI less than 18, and health conditions like CKD, hyperthyroid, hyperparathyroid, and uh, all the rheumatological and autoimmune conditions. Um, also medications like um, uh, uh, corticosteroids, anticonvulsants, heparin, PPI, so on, can increase your risk of osteoporosis. And there are so many scores in each of them uh, to assess your risk. Each of them take into account um, uh, different risk factors. We commonly use the FRAX score to uh, calculate risk. But in those more than 75 with a fragility fracture in UK, we automatically look into uh, con consider bone protection. And in terms of bone protection, you've got different agents like bisphosphonates, denosumab, and uh, for more severe uh, conditions, you've got um, calcitonin, teriparidine, uh, tamoxifen, and estrogen. Um, we commonly use um, bisphosphonates and denosumab. Most of these act on osteoclasts uh, to prevent bone resorption. Um, uh, in terms of these medications, uh, especially the first two, you look into, uh, it's important to assess their dental health and um, to prevent, um, to see if they need any procedures to be done before initiating these treatments, because these are long-term treatments and uh, they increase the risk of osteonecrosis of jaw in patients with um, who, who have dental procedures after this. And also very important to look at calcium levels because they tend to cause hypocalcemia. So it has to be normalized before you initiate all of this. And of course, vitamin D replacement is important in these patients. Um, Pre-fracture um, uh, in terms of physiotherapy is again very important in hip fracture patients. Pre-fracture physical inactivity and disability predicted increased um, uh, length of hospital stay. Um, so what works as, as uh, previously explained, multi-component exercises, um, including strength, endurance, flexibility, and balance training with a, for a minimum of three months. Um, two to three, uh, in, intensity would be two to three supervised sessions with or without a take-home program. So that um, was about falls. And don't worry, we're finishing soon. So coming to the last, which is polypharmacy. Um, polypharmacy, there is, uh, what is it? Um, there is no specific number. It's usually five and some say 15 or more, but what is most important is whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. Elderly patients have multiple comorbidities. So uh, uh, commonly patients here would have COPD, hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and depression. Um, uh, so, you know, the common uh, polypharmacy is one of the common cause of admissions to hospital, one in six patients to be more frank. And uh, the co common medications that are culprits include diuretics um, causing AKI, NSAIDs would be uh, triggering AKI, heart failure, and warfarin causing bleeds, opiates increase the risk of confusion and constipation. And of course, you've got uh, steroids increasing risk of bleeds again and confusion. So it's a holistic approach. That's, that's what we need to establish patient goals and desires and see if the medication's still needed. It may have been needed at that time when it was started, but uh, with, with 
change in the patient's status each time each of it has to be reviewed. Um, and so important to get patient opinion about medications and that's what the pharmacists do. Are they actually taking the medication? Did they stop some? Why did they stop? Is it giving them some side effects? Because there's no point prescribing when they're not going to take them. And some of them have loads of medication uh, prescriptions stored up in the in their house, not being used. And pharmac um, and also important to know why we uh, um, we say lower dose of medications and try to avoid some is because the pharmacokinetics in elderly are different from the younger adults. So the, there's reduced absorption from increased pH and delayed gastric emptying. Um, there is, uh, the distribution is different. There's more body fat and less body water with increased age. So fat soluble uh, medications like benzodiazepines stay there for longer. It's, there's a greater T half and water soluble ones like digoxin and diuretics. You just need a smaller dose because there's less uh, water in the body for distribution. And there's increased permeability of blood brain barrier. So you need lower dose of benzodiazepines and so on. And metabolism, there's reduced liver metabolism. There's uh, due to longer length of stay of those, uh, resulting in longer length of stay. And so there's more drugs stimulating and inhib inhibiting the cytochrome P450 and all, all those enzymes causing more interactions. And there's reduced renal clearance of water soluble drugs. So it's important to use um, creatinine clearance rather than GFR. These patients also have a reduced muscle mass, uh, therefore producing less creatinine. So always use the creatinine clearance in elderly. And also the pharmacodynamics is different in elderly. So there's reduced baroreceptor re response and therefore need to be cautious while using diuretics, medications for BPH like tamsulosin, cardiac medication, sildenafil, and so on. And more sensitive to anticholinergic effects in the CNS, uh, and therefore be more cautious in using antihistamines, medications for overactive bladder, uh, TCAs, and muscle relaxants. And it's an important concept is the anticholinergic burden in elderly because a lot of these uh, medications have anticholinergic effects, which cause dry mouth, dry eyes, urinary retention, constipation, tachycardia, confusion, and hallucinations. All these increase the risk of falls and major comorbidities in these patients and confusion as well. So uh, medications, depending upon the extent of the anticholinergic effects, are uh, uh, classified on a scale of one to three, one being the most side effect causing and three is uh, lesser. And um, so we need to look into that. And then there's, um, we need to look into drug-drug interactions. So someone in demen with dementia on donepezil uh, comes with incontinence, think twice before pr prescribing some anticholinergics uh, for bladder like oxybutynin and amitriptyline or, or medications like amitriptyline for uh, sleep and so on or, or pain. And also uh, medications like sulfonylureas, when they are on that, you need to think twice about uh, beta blockers, which can um, reduce the um, uh, signs of hypoglycemia or uh, Bactrim, which can reduce, uh, which can increase risk of hypoglycemia in these patients. And of course, there's drug disease interactions to look into, like uh, NSAIDs increase your risk of uh, AKI, hypertension and heart failure. So that's all, all about all those things that you need to consider in terms of interactions. And then there's something called medication cascade. It, it just shows how we start medication and then start treating the side effects rather than uh, trying to look into cutting down the medication. For example, this is just an example that I came up with. So someone with, uh, has hypertension and you start them on amlodipine, and then they develop leg like, swelling and you give them furosemide for that. And the furosemide can cause hypokalemia. You start them on Sandoke or potassium supplement and that can cause increased reflux and uh, esophagitis. So you start them on pantoprazole. Um, oh, well, I could st go on with pantoprazole that can cause hyponatremia and so on. And the furosemide, uh, some doctor sees this patient on furosemide and says, hey, this patient probably has heart failure. Why is he not on ACE inhibitor? Let me start them on that. And that could cause a cough. And 
patient may think, uh, the, the doctor may think it's asthma or a COPD and start them on inhaler. And that can cause a uh, risk of, um, steroid inhalers can increase risk of um, fungal infections, um, and then you might be on an antifungal and so on. So instead of nipping it at the bud and trying to change the amlodipine to a more suitable antihypertensive, you've just gone on and on treating every side effect with more and more medication causing more burden on the patient. So think about that. And what we use in the UK currently is the stop start criteria, which is a screening tool for older persons prescription and the screening tool to alert doctors to write, prescription, write treatment criteria. And this stop frail criteria is very useful too. And previously, there was the Beers criteria, which is still being used. Uh, but um, the thing is, this doesn't tell you uh, what medications to uh, start the patient on. It only talks about medications to avoid. And always think about alternate options for the patients, like um, if they are in pain, um, why not also try physiotherapy? And if they've got depression and so on, why not also try uh, psychotherapy along with it? Also be careful with medications like narcotics, narcotics which need a co-prescription with laxatives and anticoagulants need to be very careful all the time. And um, also um, uh, cardiovascular drugs, neuroleptics and PPIs. These are like the medications you need to be careful with. So that was some of the major ger geriatric syndromes. And in summary, what I'd like to say is there's a, an increasing population of elderly all over the world. And in 2018, for the first time, those more than 65 outnumbered those more than five years. And um, by 2050, those more than 80 would almost triple from about 150 million to about 425 million. And uh, those more than uh, 65 by 2050 will be one in six as compared to one in 11 at this point. So there is an increase in need for geriatricians and um, an increased uh, need for awareness on care for geriatric patients. And also to be aware as uh, it summarizes that frailty is due to complex interplay of multiple factors. I mean, if, if, if you haven't got all of it, at least you need to get this, that the body's reserves are, are reduced and there's a complex interplay of so many factors and hence you need to address each of the different aspects of these patients. And it's just important to address frailty in elderly. Um, so that's about it, thank you. I know it was a pretty long talk, but uh, thanks for listening. Um, any questions at all? Uh <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Maya. Uh, Maya has given a pretty comprehensive talk covering frailty, comprehensive geriatric assessment and geriatric syndromes or frailty syndromes as they are now known. Uh, so basically... Um, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Maya, if you can please uh, unshare your presentation. Okay. We'll do that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Over to you, sir. So I think the challenge in uh, geriatrics, especially in the outpatients, is collecting a large inf amount of information in a short time. So uh, comprehensive geriatric as, uh, assessment can take you two hours. Uh, so what we do is we have a health worker mm -hmm. filling up our form before we see the patient. So we see the patient and uh, all these the screenings are all simple. Uh, start with a simple screening and go on to a more detailed one if required. So you have to screen for, the health worker can screen for everything, including hearing, uh, vision, uh, proximal mobility, distal mobility. They can do the timed up and go test, uh, three word recall. It works, artifact history of falls, fractures. Because it, uh, I mean, the average time taken for a new patient workup in the UK and Australia would be one hour. Mm -hmm. So most of us don't have that much time. So we function by using a health worker. Anyway, well, we thanks for that. We, yeah, we still have um, in the outpatient setting, we do have um, a physiotherapist doing all these tests and we have a nurse and a healthcare assistant. So three people actually doing these jobs before we actually see the patient. So our clinic time is 
uh, I mean, that really helps us as well because we, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we do have one hour for the patient besides all of this. So in India, we may not be that fortunate to have so many. So we manage with one healthcare worker who collects most of the data for us. Anyway, I think we'll just go straight on to the questions. There are a few questions mm -hmm. which I'll address to Dr. Maya. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, from Dr. George Chandy, why is exercise with nutrition, that is proteins, important in frailty? And what's the physiology? Well, uh, it's just uh, uh, the findings from a randomized clinical trial. They have found that... Um, uh, from the trial that uh, protein alone uh, or nutritional supplement alone doesn't really result in uh, uh, increasing the muscle mass because they're not really utilizing it because of deconditioning. So we need to start using the muscles so that the uptake improves uh, and uh, there's improve, increased muscle mass. And uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned that uh, essential amino acids, especially using, has been found to um, be associated with improvement in sarcopenia. If I can add, uh, uh, sir, this uh, frailty seems to be a sort of a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be initiated by an acute illness, which uh, tips the patient to a cycle of frailty, often mm -hmm. starts with anorexia of aging, lack of smell, lack of taste, decrease intake. Mm -hmm. which causes uh, wasting, loss mm -hmm. of muscle mass, low mm -hmm. energy, lying in bed all the time. And then it just becomes a vicious cycle. So yeah. the way to get them out of it is not just protein supplements, but also exercise, especially uh, resistance training. Yes. Not just walking, but any exercise is good. Yeah, definitely. Now, the next question is also from Dr. George Chandy. What is the safest and the best sedation for the elderly with dementia? Sedation. We really try to avoid sedation as much as possible. Um, uh, when uh, it depends on the cause, why are you sedating the patient? Um, if it's for delirium and confusion, there has been evidence that as mu it's better to avoid sedation as much as possible. Do try the um, non-pharmacological measures as in uh, uh, keep one-to-one -one for them and try to keep reorienting them and try to keep answering their questions. And uh, uh, that would calm them much better than sedation. Um, but if, if, if the patient's going for a procedure, we probably would give a 0.5 milligram of lorazepam like for a CT head and they're not cooperating. Uh, that would be uh, it. Um, and again, uh, with uh, patients with Parkinson's, you need to be cautious to avoid haloperidol and, and certain other things. But yeah, we try to avoid sedation as much as possible. Uh, just a comment from my side. When uh, dementia, I think the main issue, is it just sleep? Or is it behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia? And are they actually at risk to themselves or to others because of their behavior? So if it's a behav say major behavioral psychiatric symptoms of dementia, the standard drug we'd use is quetiapine, uh, which has good sedative effect and, can be and is generally given at bedtime. Uh, trazodone, there are a couple of studies with, for use of trazodone for sleep and dementia, which have shown that it may be useful. Trazodone is an antidepressant and it can be started in small dose. But as Maya says, we would generally try to manage with non-pharmacological measures as far as possible. However, if a, a demented patient is up all night, it makes life miserable for the caregiver. So generally, we would tend to try to keep the patient awake in the day and perhaps use quetiapine if there are significant yeah. behavioral quetiapine psychiatric, quetiapine psychiatric symptoms. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions? If you could please type them. or uh... Yeah, we have our uh, director and CEO, Dr. George Chandy, sir, online. So if, sir, if you can say a few words. Maya and Prasad, that's been fantastic. Really comprehensive, and we've learned a lot. We just want to say thank you very much to both of you for having, uh, to having taught us so much. And I think all those listening to you have gained so much. I have learned so much myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Shall we close then? Uh, thank you, Nika? sir. Yes, yes, sir. I think we can close. So, um, 
I hope there are no more questions. All right. So, especially Maya, thank you so much for that um, comprehensive uh, explanation about uh, polypharmacy, the stop and start criteria and all that. I really enjoyed that from my perspective. And yeah, that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking your time off from all your COVID duties and from your little one, of course, and uh, coming over online to give us this brilliant talk. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, Absolute pleasure, Jacob. And um, um, uh, uh, definitely, I, I would grab any opportunity to uh, uh, teach because that's, I think, the best way I learn. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was great uh, to know you, Doctor. Get to know you, Doctor Matthews. Um, and uh, you were uh, you absolutely perfectly summarized everything for us. Um, good to know you. Thank you so much. Sure. Nice meeting you too. And thank you so much, Prashad Matthews, sir. Thank you so much for that admirable moderation. And thank you so much for accepting to moderate, in spite of welcome. all your. Uh, extreme busyness. We are really grateful that you came over, sir. Thank you so much. I can never say no to Dr. George Chandy for anything. <laughs> I see him there. Very true, sir. None of us can. None of us can. <laughs> Thank you, Prasad. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye, yeah, very, grateful. very grateful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And, and thanks to all the participants. Um, thank you for uh, logging in. And I'm very sure that all these uh, points would have really um, gotten and especially our students, uh, this will be very useful for you in future. So um, all the best and have a blessed weekend. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Prashad, sir. Uh, thank you, George Chandy, sir, and everybody else. Lovely. Thanks. Right. Bye. Yes. Signing off from Believers Church Medical College. See you then. Bye.